Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's April 1st. Happy April Fools! Today we celebrate the one-year anniversary of the show and the man who wrote A Flora of the Middle East. We'll learn about the German botanist who discovered mitosis and chloroplasts. We celebrate the 93rd birthday of an English-Australian gardener who learned to garden and survived during World War II. We'll honor the tremendous work of Kenya's garden activist and founder of the Green Belt Movement. Today's unearthed words feature words about April. We grow that garden library with a book that was released 16 years ago today. And then we'll wrap things up with the fascinating story of a whiskey baron who used his great wealth to create an arboretum that is home to America's largest collection of holly trees. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners around the world in today's curated news. First up is a post from Megan in Missouri, who writes that during the pandemic, they're harvesting dandelion greens to supplement salads. They're nutritious and they add flavor. Then next up is a post from Pam Patrick out of South Dakota, who shares pictures of her rhubarb. It's just starting to emerge out of the ground. You know, this year, many of us may actually get around to dividing our rhubarb and making an even bigger rhubarb patch. And of course, if you're looking for rhubarb, all you generally need to do is to put the word out with your neighbors, and I'm sure someone will come through for you. And that transaction, of course, can take place with all the social distancing rules. So if you're going to share plant material, please make sure to do it in a smart way. Now, early spring is the perfect time to renew your rhubarb plant through division. And splitting rhubarb could not be easier. All you need to do is dig it up and divide it. Now, for some of you in colder climates, you might need to wait until the soil warms up a bit. But as soon as you can get your shovel in the ground, you can begin dividing your rhubarb. Now, if you've never divided rhubarb, just know that you should do that every five or six years. One mother plant can typically be split into three or four chunks. And that division helps keep your rhubarb healthy and happy and productive. Then finally, Sarah in Nova Scotia sent me an email and shared a picture of her crocus. They're up and blooming, and she did a marvelous job of planting them right in her lawn. And I might add to beautiful effect. Naturally, crocuses are found in woodland, scrub, and meadows. And I love crocus. To me, they're the first sign that spring has truly arrived. Now, crocus have a number of different bloom colors. There's white and purple and yellow, of course, but there's also lavender, lilac, and striped. And if you're able to plant them by color, you could have a beautiful white crocus garden, or you could plant all yellow crocus and amp up the sunshine in a bed of daffodil. And here's a little fun fact about crocus. Crocus are often called the light bulb flower. Why? Because they look like little light bulbs until the petals relax and open into the cup-shaped flower. And here's one more fun fact. The name crocus refers to the color yellow. In fact, the Greek word for saffron is crocus. And in Arabic, the word saffron means yellow. Who knew? And finally, did you know that the spice saffron is obtained from the stigmas of crocus sativus? 
Well, it is. This is an autumn blooming species of crocus. And you can imagine how many crocus you need to grow in order to be able to harvest enough stamens for a jar of saffron. And now that you're pondering that, just know that it takes over 4,000 dried crocus stigmas to get one ounce of saffron. And all of those stamens need to be harvested by hand. It's no wonder then that saffron is the most expensive spice in the world today. So there are some interesting things about crocus you maybe didn't know. Well, it's hard to believe that the Daily Gardener podcast is already a year old. I started the show last year on April 1st, and I thought it was fitting because this month's name comes from the Latin word aperio, meaning to open or bud. So it was the perfect time to start something new. Plants outside and in are really beginning to grow now. Daisy and sweet pea are this month's birth flowers, and we'll talk about each of them in upcoming episodes this month. Now, to participate in the Gardener Greetings segment of the show, all you need to do is send me your garden pics, your stories, your birthday wishes for fellow gardeners, and so forth to jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And just make sure that you get that little extension right. It's jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And here's a reminder for an easy way to listen to the show while you're at home. Just ask Alexa or Google to play The Daily Gardener podcast. It's just that easy. Today's curated article is from Cleveland.com. This is an article that was shared by the Associated Press, and the title was called In Chaotic Times, Gardening Becomes Therapy. Here's an excerpt. With everything shut down and people stuck in their homes, the itch to go outside has turned backyards into a getaway. Now, as gardeners, we already know that working with the soil is a way to connect with nature. It helps reduce anxiety and it increases the amount of serotonin in our brains. The article shares that families are discovering that gardening gives cooped-up kids something to do. It builds their self-esteem, and it brings variety to what has suddenly become a lot of time spent together. And there's been a lot of talk around victory gardens a practice that started during World War II. Those gardens helped protect against food shortages and boosted patriotism and morale. And this article referenced Holly Niblett from Kansas City, Kansas. She has a degree in horticultural therapy, and she has a kitchen garden that's near her back door. She grows perennial flowers and flowering trees and shrubs, and her various gardens are connected by a path that goes through an area that's been left in its natural state. Holly writes, there are so many things about it that feed my soul. Right now, more than anything, my garden gives me hope, gives me purpose, and provides a sense of connection to something bigger than myself. And I just wanted to take a moment to remind you that under normal circumstances, I'd be telling you to put the number 811 in your phone. It's your call before you dig number so that you can get the lines marked in your yard. But right now, those services in many communities are no longer available. They've been put on hold which means you can't call before you dig. So right now, don't dig. 
especially in an area that you're unfamiliar with. If you're going to start a garden, go up. Build raised beds using boulders or wood and spread the word with your friends and families. Since we can't call before we dig, we shouldn't dig at all. All right, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out my curated news articles or blog posts for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of them with the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show. It's called the Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to take notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for the Daily Gardener Gardener community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. And another way that you can get all of this information delivered right to your email box is to head on over to the website, thedailygardener.org, and sign up for my Friday newsletter. I put all of these handy little tips together for you, and then you can share them very easily with your gardening friends and family. All right, here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of George Edward Post, who was born on this day in 1838. Now, gardeners remember George because he wrote A Flora of the Middle East. Westerners were delighted with this because for the first time, this type of flora was written in English and people could understand it. George botanized in Syria, which is where he lived most of his life. He was in Syria serving as a missionary and a doctor. In his spare time, though, he would be off collecting plants and then working on his flora. George was a man who had tremendous energy and stamina. He worked long hours, and many of his colleagues acknowledged that George accomplished more than most folks in a 24-hour period. This is probably because George had the ability to fall asleep quickly, which no doubt helped him recharge on demand. And there was one account of George's tremendous lust for life and for plant collecting that made me chuckle. Apparently, George would go off into the mountains on horseback. And the story goes that George was such a good horseman that he could collect specimens without getting off his horse. He was allegedly able to lean below his saddle and reach way down to cut and collect a specimen. Then he'd just sit back up and go on his way. And it made me wonder just how tall that horse was. At the end of his life, George was aware that his body was worn out, and he said something to that effect in the days before he died. Around that same time, he received a visitor who knew just how to revive his spirits. George's guest placed a few specimens of ripe wheat in his hand as a symbol of the harvest and of the specimens that George had spent a lifetime studying. And in this biography of George, it said that this gesture also served as a reminder of this treasured Bible passage. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Today is also the birthday of the German botanist Hugo von Mohl, who was born on this day in 1805. One newspaper said that von Mohl was the greatest botanist of his day. Hugo von Mohl was the very first person to propose that new cells were formed by cell division. And so mitosis was first discovered by Hugo von Mohl. 
And in 1837, he discovered chloroplasts, something he called chlorophyll kernin, which is German and translates to a grain of chlorophyll. 47 years later, the Polish-German botanist Edward Strasberger shortened the term chlorophyll kernin to chloroplast. Now, von Mohl described chloroplasts as discrete bodies within the green plant cell. And today we know that chloroplasts are the food producers of the cell. Chloroplasts are only found in plant cells, and they convert light energy from the sun into sugar. So without chloroplasts, there would be no photosynthesis. And finally, in 1846, von Mohl described the sap in plant cells as the living substance of the cell. And he also created the word protoplasm. So hats off to Hugo von Mohl. He discovered a lot about plants. And today would be his 215th birthday. Now, today is also the 93rd birthday of the English-born Australian horticulturist, conservationist, author, broadcaster, and television personality, Peter Kundle, who was born on this day in 1927. A Tasmanian gardener, Peter was the friendly host of the long-running Australian TV show, Gardening Australia. This show was one of the first shows committed to 100% organic practices and also gave practical advice. Peter inspired both young and old to garden. And here's a little story I love to tell about Peter. There was one episode that was epic. It's called the Lemon Tree episode. And in this episode, Peter gets a little carried away and he starts pruning this lemon tree. And essentially, when he is done pruning, this tree was little more than a stump. And so the term condolization became synonymous with over pruning. Gardeners had a lot of fun with that. So if that happens and you know someone who goes a little crazy when they prune, you can say that they did a great job condolizing that tree or shrub. Now, Peter learned to garden when he was just a little boy. His first garden was a vegetable patch, and it happened to be on top of an air raid shelter in Manchester, England, where he was born. His family was impoverished, and his dad was an abusive alcoholic. And two of his siblings died of malnutrition. So through all of this, the garden brought Peter stability, nourishment, and reprieve. Of that time, Peter recalls, quote, lying in bed in the morning, waiting for it to be light so I could go out and get going in my garden. And he said, I used to think there was some gas given out by the soil that produced happiness. Ugh, that story just gets me every time. And here's another great story about someone who was born today. Today is the birthday of the Kenyan ecologist and the woman who became the first female Kenyan PhD and professor Wangari Mathai, who was born on this day in 1940. Wangari was the founder of the Green Belt Movement, and she also fought to empower women by working with communities to plant green belts of trees. Today, the Green Belt Movement has planted over 45 million trees across Kenya to combat deforestation, stop soil erosion, 
and generate income for women and their families. In 2004, Wangari became the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Committee recognized her contribution to sustainable development, democracy, and peace. And Wangari authored four books, The Green Belt Movement, Unbowed, a memoir, The Challenge for Africa, and Replenishing the Earth. Wangari died from ovarian cancer in 2011. She was 71 years old. But it was Wangari Maffei who said all of these fabulous quotes. She said, We think that diamonds are very important. Gold is very important. All these minerals are very important. We call them precious minerals. But they are all forms of the soil. But that part of this mineral that is on top is the skin of the earth. And that is the most precious of the commons. Wangari also said, Using trees as a symbol of peace is in keeping with a widespread African tradition. For example, the elders used to carry a staff from a tree that when placed between two disputing sides caused them to stop fighting and seek reconciliation. Many communities in Africa have these traditions. And finally, Wangari said, when we plant trees, we plant the seeds of peace and hope. In unearthed words, today's words celebrate our new month. Here's one from Mark Twain, the American writer and humorist. The first of April is the day we remember what we are the other 364 days of the year. Let that one sink in a little bit. And here's one from the Poor Robin's Almanac from 1790. The first of April, some do say, is set apart for All Fool's Day. But why the people call it so, nor I, nor they themselves do know. But on this day, are people sent on purpose for pure merriment. Here's a sweet one from Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American essayist and poet. The April winds are magical and thrill our tuneful frames. The garden walks are passional to bachelors and dames. And finally, here are two excerpts from Shakespeare. This first one's from Act 4, Scene 1, in As You Like It. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes when they are wives. And finally, here's this one from Romeo and Juliet. Act 1, Scene 2 Well-appareled April on the heel of limping winter treads. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, On the Wild Side, by Keith Wiley. It's hard to believe that this book was published on this day already 16 years ago in 2004. The subtitle to this book is Experiments in the New Naturalism. Way back in the early 2000s, Keith created his own wild garden after being inspired by rural England. He also discovered an entire world of influence as he studied New England roadsides, the Colorado Rockies, the Alpine Meadows of Switzerland, and the South African savannas. In this book, Keith strives to capture, quote, 
only the spirit of wild plantings and never attempt to replicate exactly any landscape or combination of plants. So he is not a fan of plant by number. Instead, Keith has learned to focus on form, color, and placement of plants. His attention to detail is what makes his approach work so well. Keith was an early advocate of grouping plants into plant communities, and he loves it when plants self-seed, especially when they create beauty in unanticipated ways. Keith's book shares many of his favorite plants and plant groupings. He offers tons of advice and ideas for gardens. In this book, he's hoping to inspire us to get creative, quote, freeing your own creative inner spirit from the straitjacket of horticultural tradition. Love that quote. Today, you can get a used copy of On the Wild Side by Keith Wiley and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $8. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the anniversary of the death of the American businessman Isaac Wolf Bernheim, who died on this day in 1945. In Kentucky, Bernheim made a fortune selling and distilling whiskey, and in turn, he used some of his wealth to create the Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest. In 1931, the Frederick Law Olmsted firm was asked by Bernstein to design the park. They created roadways, paths, and natural areas. They planted trees and turned the farmland back into meadows, lawns, and forest. Sparing no expense, Bernheim provided the capital to add lakes and rivers and ponds for an enlivening effect. Nineteen years later, in 1950, the Bernheim Forest officially opened and it was ultimately given to the people of Kentucky in a trust. Bernheim is the largest privately owned natural area in Kentucky. Today, the Arboretum's Holly Collection is among the best in North America, with more than 700 specimens representing over 350 individual species and cultivars. The author Emily Bronte once wrote about Holly. She said, love is like the wild rose briar. Friendship is like the holly tree. The holly is dark when the rose briar blooms, but which will bloom most constantly? A little nod to friendship. Bernheim's holly collection features 176 American holly, 44 Japanese holly, and over 50 deciduous hollies. There's 19 cultivars of inkberry, which is also a type of holly, and there are many specialty hybrids. The Arboretum is also home to maples, crab apples, conifers, including dwarf conifers, oaks, buckeyes, ginkgos, ornamental pears, and dogwoods. There's a sun and shade trail, a quiet garden, and a garden pavilion. And in 1994, the state of Kentucky made Bernheim the state's official arboretum. Isaac Bernheim was a true visionary, and he wrote that nothing is static in this world. He appreciated that the world was constantly going through continuous change, and so he believed that people needed to anchor themselves and spend time connecting with nature. In August of 1939, 
Bernheim set up some conditions for his forest and arboretum. In a letter to the trustees, he proposed the following rules for his forest. He said, there should be no discussion of religion or politics, no trading or trafficking, no distinction between rich and poor, white or colored. He said, my vision embraces an edifice beautiful in design. It may be made of marble or of native stone, but within it, there will be an art gallery and there will be busts in bronze of men and women whose names have risen to places of distinctive honor in Kentucky. A museum of natural history containing specimens of every animal of this hemisphere will be built. And there will be a tall steel pole that will float the American flag. And children will be told the story of liberty. And of his arboretum, he said, I send the invitation to come to recreate your life in the enjoyment of nature. Come to the park, which I have dedicated, and which I hope will be kept forever free. So there you go, the Isaac Wolf Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest in Kentucky. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember... For a happy, healthy life, garden every day. During the COVID-19 pandemic, The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota. You can find today's show notes over at thedailygardener.org. That's thedailygardener.org. And to participate in the Gardener Greeting segment, send your garden pics, stories, birthday wishes, and so forth to jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And to listen to the show while you're at home, just ask Alexa or Google to play The Daily Gardener podcast. It's that easy. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. And don't forget to share the show with all your garden friends. Finally, I want to thank my fabulous behind-the-scenes team of Brooke, Kiana, and Paige, and my editor, Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.